Fort Lewis College's public art collection reflects both the values of our generous donors and our heritage as innovators and pioneers in the arts. And while some works are easily appreciated, others can seem baffling to the untrained eye. So to shed a bit of light on the topic, we asked the art writer and critic Judith Reynolds to guide us on a short but informative tour through the FLC collection. We hope you enjoy it. Here we are in the outdoor amphitheater at Fort Lewis College. We're right in the middle of the campus, very near the Campanile over here, the clock tower. Beautiful, beautiful day. And I'm reminded how important public art is to any institution, and particularly an educational institution. The fact that there are works of art at various locations all around the campus, on the sides of buildings, freestanding in a park over here, inside of a building, on a wall. These are all points of congregation and community. Students say, I'll meet you at the River Potters. Um, students and faculty may meet, may have an outdoor class by a work of art. And that's a wonderful way to come together and have a common experience. And I would hope that when you approach any work of art, the first thing you do is just simply look at it, observe it, wonder what it's all about, walk around it if you can, and let the reality of that work of art just seep into you so that you have some kind of an encounter, personal one of your own, and then reflect upon what it may remind you of, if you've seen something by this artist before, or it looks like something you've seen before, but begin at the beginning. It's you and the work of art. And that's where to begin, and that's where we're gonna to begin today. complicated, you know, for me as a non-indigenous person to be invited to create this mural. One might, you know, identify it as being appropriative and that I'm, um, as a non-indigenous person, I'm using an, an indigenous imagery. Um, but as I said, you know, it's really kind of a reflection of my life over the past 29 years and the relationships that I have built with people and, um, that's what's being represented in this image, but it's really their story that they are telling and I'm getting to witness. I'm standing 
by a large bronze sculpture titled The Intruder by Ken Bunn. It was placed here in 2001, given by the friends and family of the Ballantines and dedicated to Morley Cowles Ballantine. This is an extraordinary sculpture. It's larger than life size and it is part to me of the great tradition of guardian sculptures. It's placed here in this circle in front of the center of Southwest Studies. When you drive in, it's the first thing you see. This predatory figure is facing you and it is functioning like the guardian sculptures way back to ancient Rome and beyond, where you would have something powerful like a lion or a puma standing guard at the entrance to a great institution, a palace or a fortress or something like that. So that's its function as a large oversized sculpture and this puma is in motion. It's a bronze sculpture. It's done in a kind of late 19th century style, not unlike the sculptures of Auguste Redon. And uh, you can see all of the finger marks and the pressure pastiche put together, creating a very lively surface. The surface is alive, and then the animal, of course, is ready to pounce. Um, I'm very interested in kind of soft forms, organic forms, um, forms that might be able to um, bridge between, let's say, um, you know, our, our kind of like um, natural environments, but also, the, you know, the, the human body and then also the built environment. You know, we see a lot of kind of um, straight lines, hard edges, um, kind of hard corners within the landscape that we live in. So some of the art that I produce is trying to challenge that and trying to kind of bridge um, you know, between the kind of the built environment and maybe some of the natural kind of um, environments that we have as well. Well, I mean, obviously when you come to campus it's, it's quite inspiring. Uh, I think this is a quite unique landscape. You know, it starts with, let's say, the shape of the mountains, um, the silhouette of the mountains, um, different kind of masses that, that, are, that, that are talking to each other. At the same time, also if you look at the piece, you see some of the curvature um, towards the bottom has this kind of inspiration also some form of the trees that you find here um, and we try to also um, introduce color to the art piece that starts to um, reflect let's say some of the skies or some of the kind of um, uh, times in the day where the sky has similar colors so it starts to really become part of the the sky at the same time it also um, becomes part of the, the, the condition here that you find in terms of the, the grass or the, the tree colors and so on. Stanton Engelhart was born in Colorado and founded the art department here at Fort Lewis College. He died in 2009 and there are many paintings by him throughout the college. They are big monumental landscape paintings, but they are filtered through a modernist aesthetic. He belongs to the great tradition of uh, Western landscapes. You can always identify a, uh, an Engelhart painting by its great expanses of flat color, the way he's simplified and abstracted the landscape. He very often has a low horizon because these are frequently cloudscapes or skyscapes reflecting the kind of landscape that we have here in southwestern Colorado. Beautiful in their simplicity, splendid in their sense of grandeur. Man is very small in this landscape and it is this great beautiful earth and the planet that is the major, major subject that puts us in appropriate perspective.
This is really an artwork that's all about light and nature and time. And it is a spiral that's carved into a uh, cement block that's installed high, high up in the ceiling here. And it comes to life and it brings meaning the month before the summer solstice and the month after. And on the summer solstice, the center hosts a morning. You have to be here at five o'clock in the morning and you can see the projection of the light through that spiral window on the opposite wall. And it will come in and it'll be very fuzzy and then it becomes sharper and sharper and then it's a perfect spiral and then it carries on across the wall and disappears. And when you experience that projected light, morning light, dawn, on the wall as it slowly moves across the wall and intensifies in sharpness. It's a magical moment. Um, it's just a remarkable work of art and the subject again is light and nature and time. This multi-faceted sculpture is by Masasuki Nagase and it was installed here in 2000. I was here for the installation and this sculpture came here, looked carefully at the site, felt that wind blowing from the west against him. He quarried local stone, this beautiful pink gray granite and carved all of these pieces as if they had been blown over centuries, millennium, into this particular shape. Everything curves and arcs and bends toward the wind. And then there, many people don't even see the five pieces over here. There are five pieces of granite that are a part of this. And from the deep historical context, of course, these are standing stones. The most ancient form of art when stones were stood on end in some sacred place to mark it, either as a burial or as a sacred place for worship. Everybody knows Stonehenge and all of the standing stones that preceded Stonehenge. This by uh, Masasuke Nagase is in that great tradition. So this is a kind of sacred spot, but it marks the wind and it has this very contemporary and fresh look about it. He carefully molded and carved all of these depressions on this side as if the wind not only was bending the whole stone, but making these pulses and cavities in this. And on the back side of this sculpture, you can see that he's carved something that looks like fossil remains, some kind of reference to the fossil record here. And again, this is an, an, an undulating surface here. It's worth looking close to it and then look carefully at the corners, how he's chiseled out those corners. It's a remarkable work of art and has these deep connections in human artistic endeavor.
Steel Sculpture by Paula Castillo. This is, wow, how I feel that it's, this is the front of the sculpture because the falling is going this way in this very graceful, beautiful arc. When I first approach a sculpture, public art, whether it's painting, sculpture, ceramics, fabric, whatever it is, I just stop and really observe it. I don't ask what it reminds me of, what it suggests, what it alludes to, or anything else. And this here is this elegant curve. It's multiple parts creating this wonderful, soft, curving shape as if this was one petal made up of many, many, many parts. Horned Toad by Dave Clausen. A little scary to sit this close because he's a ferocious creature. And like the intruder, this predatory animal, this predatory ancient lizard is another guardian figure and it sits outside the Reed Library and functions as a weird, a weird and fierce and ferocious character to guard against any intruders coming in, like gargoyles and like all the ancient guardian figures are real. It's in this gorgeous bed of flowers that changes all year long. It's a splendid piece. Elemental Grove by Richard Hansen. We're standing in the midst of another standing stone sculpture. The artist, the sculptor, has treated these big standing stones with grooves. He's contrasting very smooth surfaces with rough surfaces elsewhere. And apparently there is a reference to the periodic table. And there are one, two, three, four, five stones here which have particular references to nitrogen and hydrogen and everything. I have the feeling it's a kind of puzzle, it's a sculptural puzzle for people who are chemistry majors um, who might be able to unravel it further and it's on this beautiful platform of red sandstone with river rocks embedded um, as a part of a little walkway here. It's rather elegant, it's human in scale, it's not monumental in scale, so we can relate to it. River Potters by Doug Hyde. This was presented to the college in 1994 by Arthur and Morley Ballantyne. 
this monumental sculpture, two figures joined together, big, simple forms, everything so simplified, so pure, two seated women. The most detail is in the hands, slight indications of the knuckles here, and then a slight indication in the hair, a little striping of the hair. Otherwise, every single form is simplified, purified, and made monumental to give us this great impression of two larger-than-life figures at work on their pottery. This has been a, a wonderful time here at the college. The college is in the midst of adding more public artwork and it's terribly important for any institution, especially an educational institution. Thank you so much for coming and seeing all the work that's here at Fort Lewis College.